awesome to welcome Virginia Tech head coach Mike Young to share the game with us. Coach Young completed his second year at Virginia Tech, where he has already been named the ACC Coach of the Year and taken the team to the NCAA tournament while playing an exciting style of basketball. Prior to Virginia Tech, Coach Young spent 17 years at Wolford, where he had great success winning 299 games and making five NCAA tournaments. Coach Young, welcome to the podcast. Chris, good to be on with you. I hope you're well. Good to see you. Yeah, very well, Coach. It's going to be fun to talk basketball with you. And, uh, you know, you got your job, your first head coaching job at 39. So you've been a head coach for over 20 years, Coach. So I'm just curious, getting that perspective, how much has changed for you over the years as a head coach? Golly, day, Chris, that's, uh, that's covering some ground. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, I, I think um, – the game evolves. Uh, you better evolve as a uh, as a coach, um, but uh, continue to do it with uh, with really good kids and uh, guys that uh, that enjoy being in the gym. And um, that's uh, still a, a really an enjoyable place for uh, for me to be. Uh, Skip Prosser said, "There's will never be a better place to be than in the gym," and I uh, I subscribe to that uh, notion. Um, you know, we're back at it with our team here in second session summer school and to be back in there with them um, is, uh, is, is a heck of a lot of fun and uh, continues to be. I'm having a great, great time. Uh, it's great to hear, Coach. And uh, you can see the passions, you can see the passion of how your team plays. Uh, definitely one of the most enjoyable teams to watch year after year when you're coaching them. And uh, I'm curious, you know, with with how you guys play, and I've heard this, that you do a lot of offense in practice. But I'm curious, is there a lot of two-way teaching going on at the same time you're doing offense? Yeah, it, uh, it bothers me at times, Chris. Um, I, you know, a, a little bit, a little bit. Um, you know, people um, like how we play offensively, um, but our, our team's, uh, year in year out for uh, for quite some time have been very very good uh, defensively. Um, you know, do we uh, do we spend uh, a, a bit more time offensively? Probably, I, I think because of the ball and the timing and uh, all the things that go into uh, that end of the floor. But um, our teams traditionally have been very very stingy uh, on the uh, on the defensive end. Uh, people give me a hard time. Um, you know, on the recruiting trail, playing slow, which is garbage. Uh, our numbers, the analytics, I don't know a lot about those, uh, that, that, that area. Uh, but I think that uh, our numbers are, are skewed a bit because we are so um, hard to score against. Uh, and you're not going to get, uh, well, at least I hope you're not, you're not going to get uh, something in transition. Um, and we're going to we're going to grind on you. We're going to make you get into that shot clock a little bit. So, um, you know, just uh, just some thoughts. Well, and I want to get into the defense too because I, you know I don't even know if you know this stat, but uh, you know you were the fourth best interior defense in the country last year uh, in terms of uh, defending the interior. So, for example, there's one of those stats that points to how good you guys are defensively. Um, with that, though, I'm curious, what are some of the things that have led to your success in the interior defense? And then we'll get to on the ball, which is another area where I think you guys do a great job. Chris, I, I, we're not doing anything different than anyone else. Uh, there's nothing I can share with you that's going to be beneficial to another uh, colleague, another uh, coach, another basketball fan. Um, we are going to spend some, a, a part of our practice every day in transition defense. I think that is a critical part of uh, the game and getting our team set, getting to the half court, um, corralling the ball to get it slowed down. There's so many good guards across the country, certainly in, in the Atlantic Coast Conference, that um, really create havoc in transition just by lowering their head and driving the ball. Um, but just a daily emphasis on toughness and being where you're supposed to be before you're supposed to be there, getting set. Um, just a good team defense and finishing every possession with a, a solid checkout and, uh, and pursuing that, uh, that ball. Um, like everybody else, there's so much ball screening going on in the, uh, in the game today. We spend an inordinate amount of time on those coverages. Uh, I try not to do a lot of things. Um, 
you know, there might be something we have to tweak during the course of the game that we can't get, um, we can't hard hedge this uh, this person and we've got to do something else. I do, I do uh, and would like to do even more switching one through four. We, we have the flexibility to switch one through five with uh, a lot of our personnel here now. Uh, to stay out of rotation is uh, is is important to us, um, but you know just uh, daily emphasis on the principles and the fundamentals of uh, of, uh, of of that part of the game. And to our kids' credit, they have uh, they've done a, a really nice job. And you know we've had this bunch together for quite some time now, so it's it's uh, it's not new to them. And um, you know to see uh, the recall with you know so many returning guys um, makes it uh, makes it even more enjoyable. Uh, so um, that, that's where we are. Well, and uh, one of your ACC uh, or one ACC assistant coach that I know is not in the ACC anymore, but uh, he commented on how well you guys defend the ball, that you're very active on the ball. Is there any phrasing or different things that you do on the ball that can highlight some of the success you've had there? Um, not, not, not particularly, just – how important that is, you know, I mean, things that you have heard, I have heard um, for many, many years, and then you have to be able to guard your yard. Uh, you cannot rely on help and uh, there's going to be, should be help in, uh, in the gap to your left and right. The ball cannot get to the baseline. Um, you cannot get blown by. We can't defend a blow by. Uh, and in doing so, you're putting, you're putting real pressure on, uh, you know, post players in there that are running the risk of picking up, you know, fouls with, um, you know, having to gobble up uh, dribble penetration, um, you know, one possession after uh, after the other. So, you know, I have a kid here now, Hunter Couture from Orlando, Florida. That's a very good player for us. He did not guard the ball very well uh, his, uh, his freshman year. Um, he knew that. I knew that. We all knew it. Uh, he really worked on it. And um, he's doing a a really a nice job in that uh, in that area uh, last year that will continue on, you know, through uh, throughout his career. Uh, just um, uh, we all know how how pivotal that uh, that part of the game is uh, to be able to to guard the ball and keep it in front. And um, we do we do have a, a team um, here now that uh, that does an awfully nice job in that uh, in that area. Well, that's great. And that's great to see his improvement. And I'm curious then with his improvement, is it, is it as much like just noticing and pointing it out uh, through film and through different emphasis, or are there specific things that he can do, whether it's on his own or with the staff to be able to improve his ability to guard the yard? Well, I mean, you know, we're going to put them in situations before practice, after practice throughout the summer where they're guarding, you know, uh, fours, they're going to guard uh, quick little point guards. Um, uh, we typically play with a dribble rule. You've got uh, you've got two dribbles only. You've got four dribbles. Um, you know some sort of action where they're chasing a pin down and a one on one, and he's got to fight for that, you know that top foot and get uh, get back to even. Uh, we say, um, you know, get that uh, get that foot back to the top of the floor and not allow that person to curl. Um, you know, uh, just um, I, I, we we probably play as much. One on one, two on two, as anybody out there. I still think it's, uh, you know, beneficial. I think uh, there's still a lot of a lot of that one on one, two on two that, um, you know, that uh, relates to uh, uh, to the game when you uh, when you have everybody together at five on five. And, and with that, then is there a lot of offense versus defense happening within practice? In addition, I, I imagine with a lot of the offensive stuff you do, you're still doing a lot of five on zero type of work to be we able are. to get stuff in. We, yeah, we are. We are. Uh, I just think the timing of it all is uh, is so critical. And oh, Chris, I could talk to you. Um, the gamesmanship and uh, everything matters, and uh, every cut, every uh, you know, every instance, um, you know, uh, uh, relates to that particular action. You may may not be in the action, but your um, execution of the false action. Is, is every bit as important. You know, here's what we're trying to get to, Chris, at the end of the day, uh, and, and no great revelation here. Uh, we're trying to occupy two defenders, and we're trying to isolate three and play with them. We're trying to isolate three offensive players with three defensive players 
and we're trying to get into a two-man game over there. Um, so your activity, and again, I use the word gamesmanship. We talk, we, we reference that term every day. Your gamesmanship and your foot fakes, your head and shoulders, getting zero to 60 out of a cut, uh, all of that stuff is, um, is, uh, is important to us. And uh, we try to get that to, uh, to our team. And uh, we do, we'll do something five on O every day. I just, I think it's that important. We'll do something in transition most every day, five on O. Uh, but, um, you know, at some segment in our practice, we're going to have five, six, seven, eight minutes where we are playing, um, you know, not everything, but uh, maybe uh, eight things that I have chosen for uh, today's practice that could pertain to uh, our next game and, you know, something that we maybe have seen on film uh, that, uh, that we think will, uh, will go. And, um, you know, uh, guys, we have smart people. We have really good ball handlers. We have kids that can shoot the basketball. That typically lends itself to pretty good offensive basketball, and um, we, we should have that around here again a year from now. I'm sure you will. And those eight things that you mentioned, um, that type of thing, is that related to the type of sets you're going to run versus a specific opponent or emphasis within certain sets? Um, both, yeah. both, um, you know, just uh, something that maybe we haven't seen. We haven't, uh, we haven't run. These guys do a remarkable job in their recall and, um, you know, just dust it off for lack of a better expression uh, maybe something that uh, our next opponent hasn't seen in a uh, in a bit, and um, we're just looking to get Justin Mutz into another area that uh, that that maybe they haven't uh, seen in the last uh, three or four games. Um, we'll script, you know, six to ten things to start the game with uh, to see how they're going to uh, guard it, and then we will, you know, we'll we'll spin out of that as uh, over the course of the game something may go and. I'll yell down the bench at uh, my staff. I want to see that again, you know, soon. Um, so, you know, I just um, um, want to get everybody involved uh, that, uh, that we can. And um, uh, just, you know, um, it's how we've, uh, how we've gone about it, how we've gone about it for quite some time now. Yeah, of course. And you mentioned the masking action, the false action, uh, the acting, so to speak. And then the other part I imagine that is a part of this and this this specific game prep is the counters. And that's yeah. famously something else you're you're known for is to be able to add some really cool counters to different things. Is that how you introduce them as well? Yeah, uh, I do. Uh, and you know, and I, I uh, I'm fascinated and. Um, so impressed with uh, so many colleagues out there. I, I, I really enjoy, I love watching the NBA playoffs and some of the things that, uh, that they're doing and you know, how it might relate to uh, your personnel and, you know, uh, you know how you like to, uh, like to do things. And um, you know, I'm just scribbling all the time uh, over the course of, uh, of, of the season and of the game that something might be closely related to something that we're already doing. Um, and, you know, there's an option and there's another option and there's an isolation there that we can drive. Um, I, I think that, that, that part of it is, uh, is fascinating. Uh, I really enjoy, um, I really enjoy exploring uh, those, uh, those types of things. Uh, with all that being said, um, you got to keep their feet fast. You got to keep their feet quick, uh, and you're not doing that if uh, if you have too much. Uh, so, Dell Harris, I shared this story at a clinic on uh, Wednesday. I, I share this story often. I had uh, uh, just a remarkable man and a ter terrific coach. This has been quite some time ago, and he said, "Mike, it's not so much, you know, how many things you run, but the breadth." of the, the actions that you run. And when you get right down to it, we're only running uh, three, four, maybe five things, but there are a number of uh, spinoffs from, uh, from, uh, from those actions um, with different people involved, with different you know, ways to mask what we're trying to get to. And um, you know, that, uh, that part of it, and that's been, we've been doing that for a long time now. And uh, I, did, I, I have a lot of fun with it. Uh, I think our, our team uh, has a lot of fun with it. And, 
you know, again, we have really good players that, uh, that, that can take it on the floor and execute that stuff and moving at a hundred miles an hour. And, you know, if they can't do that, you know, we're, we're, we're not going to get very far. Well, I, a few questions are, are that you run and then you run a breadth of things off of that. I'm curious then with that, is that throughout the whole season, you'll stick with that base of yeah. five or six things and then it just, everything evolves from that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, for instance, I think we scrimmage Richmond in late October and uh, I will be, we'll be really, uh, you know, really early into everything. Uh, we may have introduced quite a few things, but um we're really playing a lot of motion uh, and uh, hopefully, you know, giving them a better understanding of the game and reading screens and, you know, uh, the things that, uh, that, that we want to get to. Um, but, uh, you know, over the course of the season, uh, we are, we are adding and we are uh, polishing, if you will, we are, um, um, you know, what, uh, what worked for one team may not work for, uh, for the other. Um, will be very similar uh, with this team as we were a year ago, but, um, you know, we will, uh, we'll, we'll add a little bit. We'll subtract a little bit. Um, we've got, you know, we got a good team. I've got a really good post player in, and, uh, and, in, and, in, in Kevin Aluma, uh, Justin Mutz is a superb um, forward. Uh, I can see him playing a little small forward with, uh, with this team. Um, you know, so, I mean, that's part of the fun too, uh, you know, just uh, experimenting and, and uh, playing with it and seeing what, uh, seeing what sticks and, you know, we'll discard a lot, uh, you know, I will uh, see it in practice and I just, you know, say to myself, I don't like it. Uh, that doesn't, uh, I'm, I'm not teaching that very well. I don't think that fits and, you know, away it goes. Uh, but, um, you know, again, I, I just, uh, I have so much fun with that, uh, with that, with that part of the game. Well, I love that part of it is that uh, you're, you're saying you're willing to try something and you're willing to throw it out. And, and that has to be a part of coaching, right? This trial and error that you're not always going to get it right. You see something that you think might work, but it doesn't mean it's going to work for your team when you put it in, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, maybe you know, 20 years in this stuff, Chris is, uh, you know, lends itself to, I'm not nearly as dumb and stubborn as maybe I was at one time, you know, uh, this is really good. We have to be able to do well. If it doesn't fit, it doesn't fit. Uh, if um, uh, your team uh, isn't uh, good with it, well, you know, you put it on the chopping block and uh, and you move uh, you move along. Um, we're going to have enough things in uh, that um, you know gives our uh, team a shot night in night out. So let's not let's not be pigheaded and uh, try to. Uh, make something work because it looks so good, you know, on paper or, uh, you know, our staff really likes it. If it doesn't, if it doesn't fit your team. And sometimes I'm surprised uh, to be, uh, to be Frank, Chris, um, you know, I come back after practice on my drive home and, man, I thought that was going to be good for us. And it, and it wasn't, you know, that's, uh, that's part of it. Um, you uh, file that away in uh, your little notebook is I have one right here to my uh, right. And, uh, come back to it, uh, you know, reference it again in a couple of years and go at it again if you choose to. It's such a fun part of the coaching process. I, I love that. And if people ask me what I miss, I miss that, that ability to be able to try something and go, oh, that really works or that doesn't work and throw it away and then try and figure it out. That's so fun. The other thing you mentioned, coach, was uh, that you, you obviously value players who can execute and run stuff on offense. How hard is that to evaluate in the recruiting process? That's really hard, uh, Chris. It's really hard. Um, you know, we all, I mean, I'm no different than anybody else. We all want um, basketball intelligent people, um, skilled people that can dribble pass and catch, uh, guys that can put the ball in the basket. Uh, we certainly valued that around here and at uh, Wofford for, uh, for many, many years. Um, but, um, you know, I, have been, uh, I've been surprised. I, I, I had a couple of kids that I inherited when I got here that, uh, I had a couple of holdovers that said, we'll never be able to do that with this player, or that player. Um, and, you know, I kind of took their word for it, but, um, 
you know, as we started getting into it in July and August in summer school and then into the fall, um, you know, our fall practices, uh, they were, they were exceptional. We never, we never, we never missed a beat. Those guys did a really, really nice job in, um, you know, adjusting and, uh, and running uh, that uh, stuff. And we weren't great my first year by any stretch, but, um, you know, we were a lot more competitive than maybe even I thought we could be. And uh, I think in large part because of uh, those, uh, those returning guys and, and their, uh, you know, ability to adapt to what, uh, what we wanted to do, a different, um, you know, was a lot of different things than what they were accustomed to. Um, you know, so it, wor it worked and I applaud them and I so uh, admire uh, their, uh, their ability to, uh, to do so. But that is a big part of the recruiting process. And Chris, it is hard to evaluate. It's very hard to, you know, watch an AAU game uh, and take nothing away from AAU basketball. We all get a lot out of that. But, um, um, you know, there are a few teams uh, that uh, have uh, some structure, have uh, some things that, uh, that they're going to want to run, um, you know, each game that, uh, that you can, you know, really get a lot from in terms of evaluating those, uh, those players. Uh, but, uh, you know, it is a part of the process or part of the recruiting process. And we do, you know, the best that we can to, uh, you know, to, to, to determine uh, those guys that we think would, uh, would, would fit us. So, I mean, that speaks to a few things to not predetermine, you know, what a player can or cannot do, right? To put them in the situation, especially in a new situation where you take over and you're coaching them, you don't know how they're going to respond to the way that you do things. And that's the main part of that. And that speaks to that. And then the other thing, Coach, you mentioned the improvement from the first year to the second year. And I know you're not a huge analytics guy, but the analytics point to that too, just the improvement. And is so much of that just players now having been more comfortable with what uh, and how you do it? Yeah, I think so. Um, and Chris, I, I shouldn't tell as many people as people ask me about analytics all the time. And I had a, I was in the Southern Conference. Great coach, really good coach. He said, "You don't, you don't care much for analytics." I said, "It's not that I don't care; just don't understand it." And I know what I, is important to me: field goal percentage, defense, three point field goal percentage, defense, our field goal percentage, assist turnover, rebounding margin. Um, well, he said, "Your analytics are off the charts." So I said, "I feel better already." Thank you for sharing. Um, but um, you know, uh, I, I, I think. Chris, if we're playing the right way and we have uh, the right kids on board and um, uh, they're excited to come down here to practice every day and our team is getting better, uh, you know, uh, the, the main thing's the main thing and that's your one loss record. And, um, you know, uh, those, uh, those analytics can go somewhere else. Um, you know, this is how we would like to play, hope to be able to play and you know, through uh, two short years here, I think, uh, I think we're, we're, you know, we're getting, we're getting closer. Yeah, it's great. And like, it just shows you again, intuitively without even again, diving deep into the analytics for yourself, you play an analytic friendly style and you've always played that. That's just not something new. This has always been a part of it. So it's almost like the analytics are confirming what you already knew. Yeah. I am looking at lineups a little bit more uh, mm -hmm. that, uh, that the analytics uh, will bear out. Um, like lineup have, efficiencies? Yeah, a lineup efficiencies. Uh, there's something about that that, uh, that makes, uh, makes sense to me. Um, but I may have a lineup that I really, really like, and the analytics aren't very good. And I, I, that, that, that part of me is still stubborn and dumb. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to prove those analytics wrong. This is a good lineup. I like this lineup. I like what this lineup allows me to do. Um, but we're getting better, Chris, we're getting better. Well, and, and you said that like lineup efficiencies, you hear that a lot in the NBA playoffs and breakdowns of different yeah. lineups and lineups that haven't played together as much playing together now. And uh, it is fascinating. I mean, I love that stuff for sure. I love, I, I, I'm enjoying it. I, I listened to a really, really, uh, interesting podcast with, uh, Tom Thibodeau with the uh, Knicks uh, the other day, and he spoke a little bit about uh, about that. Uh, what a remarkable coach! I met Tom uh, many years ago. He was with Jeff Van Gundy with the uh, with the Knicks as an assistant. Then we were to clinic at Clemson together. Um, happy for his success uh, over this uh, past season. He does a terrific job.
does a terrific job for sure. And then, uh, you know, even though, you know, people might perceive your team as being a little bit set oriented in terms of the stuff you do, but what clearly shines through is that your players know how to play after the play as well, or, you know, to make reads and decisions out of the play. So they know how to play. And that, do you feel like part of that starts from the structure that you give them initially, and then all the decisions and everything come from that structure and learning how to play off of it? Well, I, I, I would, there is a method to the madness, um, if you will. Um, that stuff can look good on paper, Chris, and it can look good down there at five on oh, and it can look good when you're playing, uh, you know, against yourself in, uh, in practice, uh, but you're going to get stoned uh, from time to time. And there's going to be 12 seconds on the shot clock, 15 seconds on the shot clock, eight seconds on the shot clock, and you've got to make something, con- you know, positive happen. It's not, you're not going to score out of that stuff. Uh, basketball players are going to have to play basketball and you're going to have to, you're going to have to figure it out. Uh, so yeah, that is uh, why we do spend uh, quite a bit of time, considerable amount of time uh, in the summer, uh, in, uh, in September and our lead up to practice, uh, going into our first game with, uh, we'll, we'll have a motion segment or two every day and I will put the ball in different places on the floor with 12 seconds on the shot clock, eight seconds on the shot clock. And we've got to play out of it. Ball here, eight seconds, go. Um, and there's a flip back onto the perimeter and a flat ball screen. There's a flip onto the perimeter and a quick wide screen, a wide pin down. We're going to play out of that. That can be a, a, a Ricky, a back cut and a pop from, uh, from that, uh, from that big. Um, so, you know, so just every day, every day, um, what could we have done there? Um, maybe a couple of clips from yesterday's practice, not a lot. I don't watch a lot of film in the, uh, in the preseason. Um, but uh, some, you know, some things that, uh, that might uh, register with them, uh, get the wheels churning uh, for, uh, you know, for growth, you know, down, uh, down the line. And in those short clock situations that you drill and work on, it's great stuff, by the way. Thanks for sharing that. Do, do certain players have certain automatics or certain responsibilities based on their, their skill set? Sure. And, you know, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, if you, if you can't shoot it, you're not going to shoot it. So um, that simplifies things for certain players in a yeah. sense, right? That they yeah. know what they're supposed to do. Yeah, this is not an equal opportunity offense, Chris. Uh, never has been, never will be. Um, you know, we're going to, um, we're going to play to the things we do well. They all do something well. Um, some of them do a lot of things well. Uh, so, you know, your best player is going to get the most shots. I mean, it's just the way it is. I don't think any league's any different. Um, and, um, you know, some have a little more flexibility and a little more, uh, you know, uh, leeway than, uh, than, than others. And, uh, I don't talk a lot about roles. I think those evolve. I think those uh, you kind of uh, figure them things out, figure themselves out as you uh, as you move along. But um, you know, Kevin Aluma, Justin Mutz, uh, Nahim Aline, uh, those guys are going to get a lot of shots on this team. I can assure you that, as they should. As um, they should. Yeah, as they should. That's smart coaching, right? Um, ball security seems to be something that's very important to you as well. And that's built into the type of plays I assume you choose for your team, the counters and different things as well, but also an emphasis. Uh, tremendous, Chris. I'm probably the biggest one we have offensively is taking care of the ball. That goes back to 1982 when I had the privilege of playing for Fletcher Air at Fort Union Military Academy. Um, and he was just death on uh, on turnovers. And I have been throughout my career, and um, you know, not only a positive assist turnover ratio, but you know, um, you know, a, a really really good. Uh, I think our turnover should be under ten a game with uh, with this uh, team uh, this coming year. Um, Chris, hey, in baseball, you, you can't put people on base, you know, with a base on, on balls. You can't turn the ball over in football. You can't turn the ball over in basketball and expect to win. Uh, you've got to get a crack or hopefully two or three uh, shots at that basket every time down there. And if you're, uh, if you're not, uh, you're putting yourself in a, you know, really a, 
uh, a real bind to, uh, to, to win that particular game. Uh, so, you know, uh, every day, I, I mean, I'll say typically say something every turnover. Uh, we don't turn the ball over around here. Um, uh, make an easy play. Uh, that goes back to Coach Aaron at Fork Union. Um, you know, uh, just the old nickel and dime play, not the home run. Just make the easy play. Uh, and, and, and the ball's going to get to where it needs to get, and we're going to come out of this thing just fine. So, yeah, that's a big part of it. And you've already mentioned, like you mentioned, uh, obviously it's not an equal opportunity offense and the ball security. And, you know, those are two really important keys to offensive efficiency. What else is key to offensive efficiency for you? Uh, screening. Um, uh, we're, we're adamant. Uh, we do not, uh, we're not going to give in. Um, we don't screen air. Uh, we're going to put our body on you uh, and we're going to do it with everybody on the floor. Um, there are going to be, you know, a lot of uh, small on bigs. There's going to be a lot of big on smalls. There could be some big on bigs as we, uh, as we go along. But, um, you know, just um, every day, uh, the guy that gets the level of that screen, he opens up his hips to avoid contact and, and uh, says, I, I was afraid I was going to block. Well, don't block. Uh, get your feet set. And uh, get uh, get your rear end down and uh, and and put the put the powder on that uh, defender. That's a that that makes everything go. Um, and our teams of uh, our teams have done, you know, really a really a nice job. I'm, some of my better screeners have been uh, have been perimeter players. Um, a big part of uh, big part of what we do. So going with that, then screening obviously incorporates into this, which is player movement. Are you doing some different stuff nowadays in terms of empowering the weak side or doing different things off the ball in terms of cutting off the ball? Or is it pretty much stayed true to what you have always done? I hope I answered your question appropriately, Chris. Uh, there's a lot of misdirection. There's a lot of, there's a lot of something over here, but we're trying to get over here. Um, I say, um, I, I do think a really an effective action for us over the last several years has been, we, we, we refer to it as a ghost screen. It looks like I'm going to screen on you and I'm just going to lip out of it at the last second, um, uh, especially with a post player that, uh, that can move his feet and make it look, you know, here comes, here he comes, you know, a hundred miles an hour with his fist in the air. Here comes a ball screen. His uh, defender is beginning to spread out to, to hedge it and he's going to lip out of it, ghost out of it. Uh, now there's a cat and mouse on that uh, same side. Now there's an extra pass down the floor. He's in a long close. And now we've got uh, just something to just something to get that defense into a rotation. And, um, you know, we're big enough, strong enough, and have been doing this long enough now with the players that we have here uh, that, uh, that we can, you know, we can um, – we can make things really hard for you. We think, we hope. And you do. And the, the ghost screen part of it, coach, is that, is it sometimes, or is it either, or is it a decision or is it a call? Um, uh, I, I, uh, I empower them there uh, a lot. Um, and some of what we do, Chris, especially in transition, there's no rhyme or reason. Um, it is, um, it is, um, it is uh, empowering those uh, players. Um, and there can be a, a horns on the side and one's going to ghost out and go somewhere else on the floor uh, and just put those defenders in, you know, what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to sit on this? I've got to chase him because he can really shoot the ball. Uh, here comes a point guard at me getting downhill his guy can uh, feel behind and can really shoot. Um, you know, we may do three trips, five trips, and five on O motion to uh, to start the game or to start uh, to start practice, uh, and just getting them uh, accustomed to one another. We may wipe out a side with the perimeter player, so when that goes out of there, we can throw back. You know, and now he's playing one on one and. Uh, our four man, uh, two of them, uh, David Gasson and Justin Mutz, can really floor the ball and uh, and, and create plays for uh, for other people. Um, uh, 
I don't like the script in uh, in transition. I like the, that to be free flowing. I'm going to try something this year with this team that uh, we can run anywhere. Um, we're going to have five spots, but Aluma can run to this perimeter spot, and Mutz can run to this perimeter spot. And here comes Naheem Malin, you know, probably the best shooter we have. He's running rim to rim, and he's spacing, you know, in a cor- in a, uh, according to where the ball comes out. I've got a lot of ideas. We'll see how it uh, we'll see how it all works out. But I do have uh, an old team, a really really smart team, uh, and uh, and a team that I have a great deal of trust in. And uh, those are those are uh, a lot of times uh, a, a lot of fun to uh, to work with. I'm I'm so excited to work with this team. Well, fun for you and fun for them as well. Uh, you giving them that trust, which is such an important part of it. And uh, many coaches and colleagues of yours, when I prepared for this and I asked questions, obviously so many of them talk glowingly about spacing when they talk about your teams. Now, I think most of us have a good feel for what modern spacing is, but I'm curious, how are you teaching it? That's more the question that I'd love to get your insights on. Um, I, I just, from time to time, I walk them down to that half court and I, uh, I ask them to envision the size of this floor and why would we ever condense it? We talk about a four point line and we've got a, 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 a um, water mark uh, on our floor that is really extended out beyond the NBA arc and we want to play in there. Um, I, uh, I, I, I'll tell you, I, I, um, I don't know that Coach McKillop at Davidson uses this, but when I see his teams run to the corners, they look like gymnasts over there to really spread that floor out and um, I give your team an, an even better appreciation for uh, the size of that floor. Why would we ever condense it and make it smaller for, uh, for defenses? We want to give really good players as much room on the floor as we can to play. We want to give uh, an Aluma, um, a post player, as much room to throw the thing in there and a quick duck in that uh, that we can. Um, you know, so um, uh, again, that goes back to your five on five. That goes back to your breakdown stuff, three on O. Oh. Um, uh, just uh, – just stop something and uh, and and be aware, be aware, self-aware of where you are on the floor and how it relates to what we're doing. All right. If you're two steps farther down the floor right here, you know we've got something else on the other side of that uh, of that action. Uh, so we do we do t- talk quite a bit about that. Certainly something that we emphasize in our film, uh, just to make them, you know, more aware and. Uh, they're great. Uh, you know, I can, I can hear them talking amongst themselves in uh, some, some actions and to drop two steps right there, uh, lift on that so we can fill behind on, uh, on it. Um, you know, and again, to see all of that come together uh, is, uh, is, is, is fascinating to me. It really is. Agreed. It's fascinating to me too. And I'm lucky I get to ask the question. So uh f- you know, five to six base plays is kind of what you referred to. Are there different masking actions that can go before those plays? Can be. Yeah, can be. Um, so you would yeah. have a call for a masking action, a call yeah, for the base yeah, play yeah, and potentially yeah. a call for a yeah. counter. Yep. Yeah. We're trying to, uh, we're doing a little bit more out of that. We can run a number of things out of, uh, out of a diamond AI cut over the top. It's really the same thing. Uh, we can uh, run a lot of stuff off of a simple floppy. Uh, we're going to run that action, uh, but uh, floppy something uh, or uh, uh, diamond something uh, just, to, just to keep you off your toes. I think you can do that with your special teams. I know you can do it with your special teams. Uh, you're running the same action out of a couple of different, maybe out of a flat, it may be out of a box, it might be out of you know, another alignment that, uh, that they haven't, uh, that your, your opponent hasn't seen. And, uh, you know, everybody does such a great job of scouting. I mean, mm-hmm. we all know one another's uh, stuff. Um, I can hear them screaming on the other end. Uh, here it comes, here it comes, here it comes. Uh, but you've, uh, you've disguised it with, uh, with something else. Um, you know, part of the game, uh, again, something, uh, that, uh, that, 
that I think is uh, is fascinating, and I, I enjoy seeing it uh, all come together over the course of a season. Well, and it speaks to why so many people perceive that you run a ton of plays, right? To, to a certain extent, you know, you don't necessarily run a ton of plays. You just run a ton of plays mixed with other things that you already run. Yeah, yeah, we do. You know, two is uh, the same thing, and we've got probably six twos. Um, uh, pin to uh, just a number of things um, you know just yeah uh, it looks like it looks like it's out here but really not really isn't Chris it's really not uh, friends those are friends those guys give me uh, a little more credit than I deserve I can I can assure you that <laughs> well coach I mean you've had obviously great success at Wolford before you got to Virginia Tech but Virginia Tech you already mentioned that you're a little surprised by how good you got right away uh, I'm curious then with that, how uh, have you approached identity and team building in your short stint so far at Virginia Tech? You know, Chris, I don't do it with slogans. I don't do it with, um, um, you know, with uh, a lot of team meetings. Uh, there's a level of expectation here. Um, there's a, a hope, uh, you know, a culture developing, uh, and, you know, continues to develop. And uh, and how we do everything, uh, from academics to, you know, everything that uh, that our team is a part of. Um, you know, we're on a good course. Uh, finished product? No, I don't think we're ever a finished product. Uh, but um, you know, I, I don't want you to think that um, you know you're doing this, and uh, I want you to do more of this. I, it, it, that it, that that sort of thing evolves uh, in our uh, in our program and. Um, Kevin Aluma is a great example. Uh, first year, you know, played was a big part of our team. Uh, we had a good team that uh, that year, sophomore year. We we were really really good, and you know, he um, he had a greater role. wasn't a humongous, but it was a significant role, and he fulfilled that role, and he was awesome. Um, a big part of that team that went. Uh, to uh, on to play Kentucky in the NCAA tournament, and he works his face off and has a great, uh, you know, uh, redshirt season here. And then uh, he's with us uh, last year. He's second team all league. And, um, uh, you know, I, I can look at Cameron Jackson's development uh, in my last, um, for my last five years at uh, Wofford. He came in as a, a little heavy and, um, and it didn't, didn't, uh, didn't, move very well by the end of his career he's one of the best I've ever coached and we'll we'll go down in history as one of the best I've ever coached um you know it's just uh get a little bit better every day and um uh, especially with those post players you know pull up a chair and uh, enjoy their development it's not going to happen all at once it's going to take some time but if you've got the right kid and he's about the right stuff uh you know really neat things will happen uh, but uh, you're gonna have to wait for it a little bit so I'm mean, imagining as listening to you, and I'm sure listeners are as well, and I've met you before, but you know, you said there's not a lot of rules, there's not a lot of slogans, and there's just a humanity about you, which is to me, common sense that you're, you're a good person. And I'm, I'm imagining that that's how you treat your players. You treat them like the human beings they are. And because of that, you don't need a lot of this other stuff because there's this common respect. I, uh, there's not a lot of fire and brimstone here. And I'm now we all say we got great kids. You know, I've, I've got really good folks uh, that I love being around. I mean, I'm so excited to walk down to practice tomorrow and uh, and work uh, work with them. Chris, they've got to want to come in that building, this building that I am uh, sitting in our practice facility, Hanhurst, um, and they've got to want to uh, come here. Uh, ready to uh, go at it. We're not going to go long, an hour and 15, hour and a half. Um, they've got to be engaged. Uh, they've got to be willing to come down an hour, hour and a half early and work on their game. We don't spend a lot of time with skill development during our practice. That's our time. Uh, they've got to be willing to spend time after practice to get shots up with our managers, with our staff. Um, and, you know, uh, if um, – they're coming down and the head coach is berating them day in, day out. And, um, you know, uh, that's not going to last very long. I don't think, I don't think, and not, not, 
it's not who I am. I, I'm going to do, you know, what I'm accustomed to and what I'm comfortable with. And I hope that's, I hope that's good enough. Well, it's good enough coach. And I, the, the other part that goes with that is that it strikes me. And I think this is such an important part of, of coaching is that you're not monopolizing their time. You're not just simply wasting their time to control them. You're, you're allowing them to be people. And then what you just mentioned is this concept of the players lead themselves, right? In terms of their development as well, that it's not all coach controlled. When you're at practice, this is team practice. And then they get their time to be able to develop themselves. Is that fair? Is yeah, that kind of how I'm capturing it? Fair. Yeah. I think the you know, best teams are player led teams. Um, and, um, you know, was a little nervous about that coming here my first year it was pretty good second year better i think this year will be uh, will be even better um you know this is how we do things this is um this is what it's supposed to look like and um uh, those guys have done a great great job and um you know uh that will be a big part of uh, this program as long as i'm here certainly chris Nervous is such a good feeling, though, still as a coach at this point in your career, isn't it? Isn't it fun to be nervous and go, look, I'm a little unsure, and it takes you out of your comfort zone, so you challenge yourself, too? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'm nervous to this day, uh, you know, before uh, before games. Um, you know, part of it, you know, you're expected to win. Uh, you want your team to play well. Are you prepared? Are we ready to guard this? Are you, we ready to you know, play against this. Uh, so, you know, I'm not going to shy away from, uh, from that. We're involved in college athletics and, um, you know, there's a, a winner and a loser. I like uh, being on that uh, winning side of it. So yeah, there's some nervous, you know, energy involved in it, but you know, that's, uh, that's part of it. If I didn't want to, I didn't gravitate to that. I would have, I'd have done something else for a career. It's great. Uh, such a great career that it continues and is ongoing. Uh, just curious then and reflecting a little bit and helping some of the coaches that are trying to improve themselves and improve their coaching. What are some of the best practices that you've found to be able to develop yourself over the years as a coach? Be who you are. You know, I'm not Bob Knight. I'm not Dean Smith. I'm not Frank Beamer. I'm just Mike Young and uh, I'm going to be me and I'm going to do the best I can. I'm going to treat my team with Great respect. We're going to have a lot of fun. Uh, we're going to play, I hope, the right way and uh, take care of the ball and guard you. Um, study great coaches. Uh, see as many practices as I can. I saw them all. I saw Coach Smith at North Carolina. Um, so many great practices. Rick Barnes at uh, Clemson, Tennessee. Skip Prosser at Wake Forest. I've seen a number of NBA practices. Um, and what you take out of a masterpiece or what you take out of something is what makes it a masterpiece. You can't do everything. Uh, you've got to get to something and or, uh, things that fit you. Um, you know, uh, uh, if, uh, you know, you got to do what fits your team, fits your personnel, and you got to be honest with yourself. And if you can't do that, you're going to have a, uh, you're going to have a hard time with it. So just some thoughts off the top of my head. Well, and it strikes me the be yourself part, which which obviously you are authentic in that way. H how do you balance that with competitiveness and intensity and getting your players to say change in behavior, whether it's on the court or off the court? How are you approaching those things with your personality? I don't think that's very hard. Um, you know, we we that's a big part of our that's a big part of the recruiting now, Chris. Uh, is um, soft doesn't work in this business. Soft doesn't work at this level. It doesn't work at any level. It doesn't. Um, and, you know, I, I, we've had tough people uh, and uh, that, that understand, you know, what's at stake and, and are competitive people. Um, uh, so uh, that is a, that's a, that's a big box. That's a big box that has to be checked in our, uh, in our recruiting, which we're doing a lot of uh, right now, um, smart, uh, tough, skilled, um, you know, and pretty, pretty easy, I think, uh, to uh, determine what's important to us at Virginia Tech. If, uh, if you watch, uh, watch our team, teams play, kids that want to get better, uh, kids that want to be a part of something that's bigger than them, want to be a part of, uh, 
you know, a great team, a great, uh, a great program. Um, certainly hope that's how it works out. Well, and I've always equated hard coaching with, with honesty, with being direct and telling players what they need to hear. It's not the way you say it. It's obviously what you're saying. That's the most important part. So you can have, you know, you don't have to yell to get your point across to be honest with someone, do you? No, oh, oh no, no, I'm not doing that. Um, you know, a bad shot uh, that we can get a better shot than that. That's not a shot that, uh, that, that we, we can get that shot anytime we want, um, you know, in a possession um, that, that uh, we can get a better one than that. Uh, we don't turn the ball over here, uh, but I am never, I just, it's not who I am, Chris. I'm never um, personal. Uh, I'm not, uh, you'll never see me, um, show a kid up on a bait on the sideline. If others are doing that, that, that is their prerogative. Uh, but I do think, you know, having done it for 20 years, I'm pretty comfortable with who I am and, uh, comfortable in my own skin. And, um, you know, we have proven our staff and, uh, and I, uh, for a long haul now that, uh, you know, what we do, uh, works. And I do think that, uh, our players have a great time, uh, playing for us. And, um, you know, uh, still trying to get better every day, but having a heck of a lot of fun doing, I can assure you that. Well, coach, your teams are enjoyable to watch and you're such a great role model for all of us as coaches and fans of the game. And uh, I cannot thank you enough for uh, sharing the game with us today. Chris, I admire you and I admire what you do for the game. And it's a pleasure to be on with you and uh, wish you well, buddy. I look forward to seeing you soon.